Good morning, friends. Looking at you all resplendent in your green, it seems like it's appropriate to say Aaron Gobra as well. We welcome you to worship today and are so glad that each and every one of you have chosen to join us. Of the many places that you could have been, you chose to be with us and we are deeply, deeply grateful for that. Let us now begin our worship. Peace be with you. Let us pray. Come like Sister Miriam, leading the Hebrew people out of bondage with tambourines and dance. Come like Sister Martha, running through the dark with courage, proclaiming that Jesus is God. Come with the word of God on your lips like Antoinette Brown Blackwell, who did not fear preaching to our congregational ancestors. Come and proclaim justice like Sojourner Truth, with a passion for all people and an unquenchable search for justice. Come, sisters and brothers, as you are, and join in the worship of the one who unites all women, all men, all children, everyone. Amen. Would you all please rise and join me in singing our opening hymn, Morning Has Broken, which can be found in your bulletin. Please be seated. Join me in our gathering prayer. We give thanks to you, O God, for you are good, for your steadfast love endures forever. You have redeemed us from trouble and gathered us in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. When we cry to you in trouble, you bring us out of our distress. We give you, God, for your steadfast love, for your wonderful works to humankind, 
we lift up your name here in the congregation of the people and praise you in the assembly of the elders. We worship you here today together. Amen. Now comes my favorite part of this service. I do all the other stuff so that y'all will let me come and do this. Good morning, good morning, good morning. How are you all today? Did you have a good week? Okay. Now, I want, now I want you to repeat after me, okay? Yes, I do, and it's a beautiful necklace. I can see yours too, and it's quite beautiful. So can you say me? Say it again, me. 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 Now, I could go and sing a song, me, 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 but that's not what we're doing. You know why it's important to say me every now and then? Because God's love should make you have a strong sense of me. Because if you have a strong sense of me, then you can be kind to other people. You can care about other people. So let's try that again. Me, me. Now let's sing the song, me, 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 me. Okay, all right, let's try it again on three. One, two, three. Me, 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 me. And remember that as long as you love yourself the way God loves you, that lets you love other people. All right, y'all have a great time. Thanks for giving me a minute. Me, 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 me. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. And in that small sermon, it's remember that an adequate sense of yourself is what is required for you to have a good sense of others. An adequate sense of who you are allows you to receive others as they are. So that wasn't just for the children, that was for us too. Join me now in our prayer of confession. Holy God, you spoke to Eve in a garden, to Hagar in the wilderness, to Sarah in three persons, to Mary of Nazareth through an angel, to Mary of Bethany at Jesus' feet, and to Mary Magdala as the resurrected Christ. They brought us new insight, new promise, renewing hope, revolutionary ideas, resounding blessing, and good news. However, your church regenerations chose to curse Eve, to belittle Hagar, to shame Sarah, to dehumanize the Nazarene Mary, to shy from the Bethanite, and to doubt the Magdalene. We have been slow to accept, hesitant to allow, resistant to submit, and reluctant to change. Forgive us, we pray. Remake us so that we may be ready evermore to attend your word of loving kindness, of compassion, of faithfulness, of truth, no matter whose mouth may utter it. In Christ's name. Loving God, you restore us to each other and to you, mending our hearts and repairing the world. Through the power of your spirit, you shape us to be for others what Christ is for us, pardon and peace, new life and blessing. We give you thanks for your love, forgiveness, and constant presence. Amen. Would y'all please rise and join me in singing the hymn of response?
be seated. With calming words, with a peaceful spirit, with overflowing love and hope, our God forgives us and fills us with faith. For God affirms us for who we are, those whose brokenness is made whole, whose sin is forgiven, whose lives overflow with faith. Thanks be to God. Amen. The scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, verses 31 to 34. And we're reading it from the New Revised Standard Version updated. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another say, or say to each other, know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Please join me in singing hymn number 459, which is printed in your bulletin.
As I was reading our scripture for the morning in preparation for writing the sermon, I thought about how often it is that we hear the idea of a time when, or the days will come, or there will be a time when. I think these are perhaps the most frequent words that give a religious framing to our world. Words that talk about a time to come, a time that is better than this time. Now these words betray, I think, a yearning in the human heart for a better day, a more perfect time. And it's not just this generation, because as we can see from scripture, it was that generation too. A time when, as intoned by Annie, the sun will come out. I was humming that all day yesterday. The sun will come out tomorrow. You can bet your bottom dollar that tomorrow. You all remember that song. I had it going around in my head because that seems the eternal cry of the human heart, that tomorrow the sun will come out. There seems embedded within the heart a knowledge that no matter how bright the day may seem, it is still yet imperfect, but there is a better day to come. Now this journey is even more poignant when we think not just of our own lives as individuals, but also as our lives together as community. However, we think that the way things ought to be the perfect ordering of our community, no matter how big or how small, there always seems to be just another election ahead that'll make things better. It, all, it always seems as if there's just another referendum that's up before the city council that'll make life just a little better. That there'll be just a change in state policy or in national policy, but with the idea that things will get better than they are today. It always seems that things the way they ought to be is just beyond the horizon. So no matter how good things are, we know that there's just a better day ahead. This feeling, this pathos for the future is at the center of our faith in our text for the morning. One of the lectures I used to give in my systematic theology class was about how God lives in tomorrow and that that's where we go to meet God is tomorrow. Now with our faith it is the promise of the resurrection, a time in which we will all behold the glory of God in eternity. With our text for this morning, it is a time when God's hope and desire for the world, as encapsulated in the law, is written on the hearts of God's people and lives, and not just on the pages of some holy book around which the people gather themselves on occasion, but that it's actually something that lives in their lives. Because, you know, we can have religion of the holy book, but at least my experience has been some of the most holy people in the world or some of the people who are least helpful in making the world a better place. Now, each of these aspirations, these hopes, are rooted in the idea that in God's eyes we can be better. Both in terms of our faith and the scripture, that we read this morning. The unspoken point is that God believes that no matter what the circumstance is, we can always be better. We can always do better. A theme hearkened to throughout the Bible in its entirety is that God tells us as individuals and communities how things ought to be among us and in our world. A famous instance of this, of course, is Micah, when he says, what does the Lord require of you? 
but to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. That thing creates a thread. It picks up a thread that begins from the very beginning of Scripture and runs throughout all of the stories of the Bible. Stories of when taken up the thread and gave given flesh is actually giving flesh to God's dream for this world and the more frequent times when we did not. Stories of when we allowed limited vision to seduce us to the celebration of myopic selfishness. Now I want you to notice when I was talking to the children, I was talking about an adequate sense of oneself, not an overinflated sense of oneself that requires the diminishment of others. And too often what ends up happening is that we read ourselves, we read our religion, we read our God in a way that others must be made smaller so that we can be made big. But this is not what the vision of scripture is. This is not a celebration of turning our hearts and minds away from God and to something of our own making. This is not telling stories of when we denied the parenthood of God for all people and treated this world of God's as if it was our own personal possession. That's not what we're called to do. We're not called to believe that we are the only people of God. I give God thanks every day that my name was called in the voice of Jesus Christ, but my God is not so small that he only speaks, or she only speaks, or they only speak one language. And yet, there are also stories, and this is what our text is a part of, about how God never gave up on God's people. No matter how often they may have fallen into selfishness and into sin, God never gave up on them. No matter how often they may have fallen into the worship of the idols of whatever land they found themselves in, God never gave up on them. And there are also stories about how God still believed in them even when their sinful ways had led them to destruction and ruin and shaken their own belief in themselves as God's people. This is what the book of Jeremiah is about. It's about people who find themselves in bondage in a strange land and had become and had begun to question whether or not God was even with them anymore because of all that they had done. Our text comes from the moment in the history of God's people when they were led off into captivity in Babylon. Their freedom, their nation, all casualties of the might of the Babylonian empire turned against them. Now when Jeremiah was writing this, his audience were a people who sat defeated, living symbols of a God who had abandoned them. And when I read this text, and as I always read about this text, my mind goes back to the death of Reconstruction in the 19th century, when all of the promises of American citizenship, when all of the promises that our nation might finally live up to the true meaning of its creed were washed away for 90 years. So they sat like these people in Babylon, defeated and many feeling as if God had abandoned them. But such was not the case. The prophecy brought by Jeremiah was this. While your iniquity has brought you to ruin, it has not left you forsaken. While your iniquity has brought you to ruin, it has not left you forsaken. While your ways may have led down a path of destruction, you are not at a dead end of the journey. My journey with you is not over. I am still your God in whose heart you live, and there will come another time 
a better time in which you will again breathe freedom and walk in dignity. In those days to come, you will know that I am with you because my law and my ways will be written on your hearts, written so that every beat of your heart will be felt in mine and every beat of mine in yours. So in those days, when it seems our hearts are far apart, take courage knowing that it will not always be so. That is the message of the text today, that even in the time that it seems that we are far apart, when it seems that I have forgotten you, you still live in my heart, and I will live in yours. Now, each generation of the faithful needs to be reminded of these things, right? This wasn't a one-time deal. We need to be reminded each generation, for it is ever the case that in the flows of nations and empires, it can seem as if God has abandoned our world. It can seem that the seduction of selfish power is so strong that we are ever careening toward mutually assured destruction. Now, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not preaching politics because I don't preach politics, but I just wonder in my mind, all of these folks who are dreaming of a nation in which half of us are gone, what kind of nation do they think they're gonna have? Of the many people who think that the dream of a place in which all people are created equal and are endowed by certain inalienable rights, among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, what kind of world are they dreaming of in which half of us don't have access to those rights? So the seduction of selfish power can be so strong. And history teaches us, and the reason why I use the word seduction is because whenever we give ourselves over to it, we are mutually guaranteed to bring about our own destruction. Now in these times it can seem like uh, the law of the plains that the weak will always perish for the delight of the uh, powerful will have the last word. In such times, it is important to remember that while things may perennially seem this way, things will not always be this way. Things will not always be as it seems. That yes, indeed, it is the case that at many and varied times in human history, the need for a selfish power that enthralls others with the elevation of the self seems like it carries the last day, but it never has the last word. The stories of our faith, of people and of communities who did live to see a better day, give witness to our text for the morning. So the fact that there are in every generation people who have cried unto the Lord and seen a better day gives witness to the truth of our text. The testimony of those who walk through the dry and arid land of fear and hopelessness and yet found themselves sustained by hope and encouragement of God bear witness to our text for the morning, a text that says in these times of trouble, God still believes in us. God still loves us, and God is still with us. In these times when so many would make of our God a small tribal deity of one race or one nation, God still believes in us. In these times when our nation is being rent in ways that visit untold suffering on the least among us, even then, God believes in us. Even when we use our faith as a weapon 
against our sisters, brothers, and kin, and against the least of these, God still believes in us that we can do better. And that is what the message of the text is this morning. The message that I bring to you this morning is I came by to tell you that because God still believes in us and will never, never, never abandon us, we can find reason to believe in a better day. We can find reason to live with the courage of that day coming. So as many clouds as may appear on the horizon, there is a better day coming. As many and as often as we read about polls and we read about other indications of the future that make it seem as if the daylight is so much farther away, morning is still coming. The day will be better. And it will be better because God still believes in you and God still believes in me that we can be better and we can do better. And if we but believe in ourselves just a smidgen of the belief that God has in us, then we can change this old world into something new. Amen. So every now and then, Caesar will play one of those songs where there's not a perceptible end. So forgive me for my long pause as we move into our time of prayer. One of the greatest, I think, 
privileges that we have as children of God, as kin, as sisters and brothers and others in the household of God, is that we are able to share the joys and burdens of this life with one another. We're able to, in a very real sense, know that we are not on this journey by ourselves. And we particularly live into that privilege when we go as a community to God in prayer. So I invite you now to join me in the prayers of the people so that we might go as a community before the one who loves us so. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. We join our voices to pray and rejoice, to celebrate the good things of our life together, including the birthdays of Dee Dee Rogers, Edwin Yupa, and Leslie French. We lift our voices and pray for the innocent who suffer in Gaza and Israel. We pray for our kin suffering under the systems of racial oppression. We open our hearts to all those suffering the ravages of climate change and environmental racism. We pray for our planet and its peoples that all might know peace. We pray for immigrants and refugees seeking sanctuary and safe harbor, and for our nation, that we not lose regard for human dignity and worth. We lift up our children, that they may know hope and peace. We pray for the teachers, staff, and schools that incubate our future. We pray for those suffering the plague of gun violence, we pray for those challenged by physical and mental illness and we who love them. For those suffering grief and loss in the passing of loved ones. And for ourselves that we may ever live in the power of hope. I invite you now to share with us anything that you would have us go to God in prayer with you about, joys, concerns, anything you would like for us to be in prayer with you about. Continuing prayers for my brother Peter. God Thank in you. your mercy. Hear our A prayer for the homeless or unhoused and uh, blessings on Mark Colville. A prayer for our neighbor Donna who was suffering with blood clots in her legs and also um, an allergic reaction to her medication. God, in your mercy. Are there other prayers, other things that you would have us to be in prayer with you about? Prayers of safekeeping for Hannah and Jessica as they begin their second week of looking for employment. And because I'm on their mother, I sent a list of the UCC churches in Honolulu <laughs> and was sad to see that all three, are, none of them are open and affirming. Mm. So prayers that those ch churches understand God's extravagant love for all God's people. Mm -hmm. God in your mercy.
if you'd all join me. Is there, are there any prayers in the choir? A prayer for Gina, her husband, and for the entire family because addiction is never about one person. So prayers for them. We have two prayers from online. First from Al. Prayers for Eric as he transitions to a new medicine. And from Carol, prayers for Vi and Valerie on hospice care. God in your mercy. Let us go now to God in prayer. Merciful and loving God, whose life and whose heartbeat sustains us, the one who holds us near in good times and in bad, the one whose spirit brings us courage in times that we journey through the valley and who brings us exultant joy when we are on the mountaintop. God, we come unto you this morning as your people, having lifted up prayers for our world, which is hurting so badly, having lifted up prayers for people who find themselves in the midst of war and conflict in which the weakest are the ones who suffer the most. We come to you asking that you would allow us a moment of rest in the knowledge that you have not forsaken us nor have you left us. We ask in this moment that you would strengthen our hearts, that you would help us to find the courage to be the people that you would have us to be in the lives of others as individuals, but also as a church in the life of this city, this nation, and this world. We ask that you would give us the courage and the strength to ever be witnesses of your hope, of what this world can be. We ask that your spirit would give us strength in moments of loss as we journey through this world, being with one another but for a short time. We ask that you would allow us okay. to celebrate and rejoice for the time that we have with each other and that you would allow us memories of love to give us encouragement as we go forward in the days apart from one another. God, we ask that you would allow this church, this people, this place, to be a beacon of hope and to be a beacon of encouragement to any and all of your children who find themselves on the margins of things, who find themselves not in the center of things, who find themselves needing affirmation, who find themselves needing friends. We ask that you would give us what we need so that we can be the church that this world needs and we would be the church that you would have us to be. All this we ask in the precious name of your son, Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Amen. I invite you now to pass the peace of Christ to your sisters and brothers. Peace be with you. Good morning. I'm Cher Balcom, and I just wanted to give everyone a quick update about some things going on with Connect. Uh, one thing in particular, I guess. Um, as you'll remember, Connect stands for Congregations Organized for a New Connecticut. And United Church on the Green is an important member of Connect. And um, as a member, we participate in. Um, bringing organized people and organized money to be able to impact legislation in Connecticut. So it's a really important work that this organization, organization does that our congregation supports. One of the uh, initiatives that Connect has long been working on is something called clean slate legislation. And you may have read about this in the news or you may have read about it um, in our bulletin, our, our e-blast, but um, this is something that Connect has been working on for a very long time. And there was a celebration in January because the legislation passed and they were implementing it and it all looked good. But it's not. And the governor has really not delivered on his promises. This legislation is really important because it was meant to expunge the records of about 80,000 plus people in Connecticut, which meant that if they applied for housing or if they applied for a job, they no longer had to check that box that said, I've been convicted of a crime. So really, in, in, in terms of a justice standpoint, it really opened up a lot of doors for many, many people who are seeking housing and, and jobs and, and coming out of, the, out of the, the correction system. And the governor promised that this was going to happen. And he, he and his team just have really royally screwed this up. 
So to date, only about 13,600 people have had their records expunged, but they're not being notified. So we have no idea which 13,000 out of the 80,000 plus have been worked on and which ones are left to go. So the rollout has really, really been disappointing. I'm telling you all this not only because, you know, our efforts as a member congregation are important to that, but there's also been nothing to tell the public about this or to tell the public about the delay or they really haven't come clean about the whole thing. Connect is, gonna pl is planning an action at the Capitol on Wednesday the 27th, and it's either going to be at 9, 10, or 11. It hasn't been decided yet, and so there will be details to follow, but because it is Holy Week, I know that um, you know, the 27th is, is that Wednesday. Um, I just, if you're interested or you would like to participate, I won't, I, I'm working at that time, so I won't be able to, but if you're interested in going to the Capitol and joining folks from Connect who are going to send the message to the governor that his rollout of this essential, you know, this really important program has been really unacceptable, then um, see me. I can put you in touch with Matt McDermott or the people that are going to be going up there, um, you know, just to take a stand and say, hey, we've been with you all the way and this is not acceptable. So anyway, um, let me know if you're interested. Good morning, I'm Julie Peterman on behalf of Faith Exploration, <laughs> not formation anymore. Um, engagement, sorry, geez. Faith Engagement Committee. Um, next week is Palm Sunday, and um, just three things for youth ministry. The first thing is, we're really trying to make the classroom downstairs more environmentally friendly, get rid of a lot of the plastic that's down there. So if you're like cleaning out your house and you have any wicker baskets, larger is better than smaller, or wooden bowls, that kind of thing, we would love those. If you could um, bring them to church, we could make use of them in the classroom. Uh, next Sunday, Palm Sunday, we're inviting any children who'd like to come a little early to pass palms out at the front door. We would love to have the kids um, here to do that. And we're going to do an Easter egg hunt after services next week, but the Easter Bunny needs help. So we're gonna have a big basket of eggs in the front. And when you get here, if you could just grab a few and wherever you're sitting, hide them in your pew. When the service is over and we all get up, we'll bring the kids back upstairs and do our Easter egg hunt. So that will be happening next week as well. Thank you so much. That is correct, since Easter is so early this year, and <laughs> I really don't want to fight with the weather. We're just going to do it inside this year, yes. Thanks, Cher, and thanks, Julie. Uh, that sounds uh, uh, very important and very fun. The Connect doesn't sound as fun, but it sounds very important, <laughs> uh, and, and I'm looking forward to uh, next week. Um, my name's Abram. Uh, I serve as the moderator here. I'm honored to serve as the moderator here. Um, and I got the chance to be at Bible study on Thursday, uh, Thursday night. If you're interested, we have Bible study every Thursday night. Uh, you can get in contact with me or with uh, Roger or uh, Julie or a number of people, the pastor. Um, we got into this conversation about kind of the context and this issue of sort of idolatry came up. And then, uh, or idols, you know, the different things that were worshipped or whatever in the area. And then today I, I heard in the pastor's message uh, what I think is, is uh, idolatry. Uh, a Abraham Joshua Heschel, uh, hi. Abraham Joshua Heschel, who, do who marched with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., uh, said that idolatry is the worship of a God that is mine and not yours. It's the worship of a thing that is not for you, it's for me. Um, and when people have in their hearts the other idea that God is for everyone, that God welcomes all and calls all, it does funny things when that's written on their heart. Uh, there were a couple of checkout uh, young ladies, I don't want to say checkout girls, that sounds a little bit weird, uh, uh, but a couple of young ladies working the checkout uh, outside of Dublin uh, in the 70s, I believe, and they did, were so upset about what was happening in South Africa, about apartheid, that they decided on their own, the che two checkout people in this supermarket, they were gonna stop selling produce from South Africa. And because of these two Irish women, St. Patrick's Day, right? Uh, Women's History Month. Uh, these two Irish women, an entire movement in Ireland was born. 
to boycott and divest in South Africa, a movement that we at United were a part of. We at United, in this same time period, joined the movement to divest from a global economic source of goods that was for one group of people and not another. Because that's not what government should be. That's not how we should treat people who have no choice but to live in a land. We should treat them with the kind of welcome uh, that we've heard uh, and that we hear about every week uh, here at United. Um, so yeah, those are sort of my reactions. People like when I, I, when I say nothing like that, people are less positive than when I offer some kind of thoughts or comments. And so, you know, if you don't want me to offer thoughts and comments, stop encouraging it. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you so much uh, for coming. It does mean a lot that you joined us on YouTube, uh, here in the building. Um, it's so nice to see some new faces and to see some people back. I'm so happy that Julie is back. If you're like, if you're like us, you're very happy Julie's back. Um, right? Yeah, she's happy. Um, uh, and no matter who you are or where you are in life's journey, this is a place of welcome for you. Thank you. I just have a, a couple of announcements. One is that um, next uh, um, Sunday, leave yourself five or 10 minutes after service to walk through the narthex. We've gone through the list and done all the things that we can do at this point, and we just need to have a check-in. So, so that time that you all spent and the special uh, time uh, I want you to see what the um, results of that were. So next Sunday, because we still have to do a little bit more cleaning up. Now, the reason why I want you to do that next Sunday is because the Sunday after that is Easter. We have a significant sort of invitational um, outreach to our community that's going to be on social media. We're going to have the sandwich board in the front. We have an ad in the New Haven Independent. So sometime this week, you'll be receiving um, or you'll be able to see our social media outreach. So if you are able to share that on whatever social media you are on, whether it be Facebook, and I don't think you're a TikTok crowd, so you don't have to worry about that, but Facebook, Twitter, whatever social media you use, we invite you to share that so you can invite the people who are a part of your network to join us for service on Easter Sunday. Because as you all know, Easter Sunday is a big day for those Christian folk. So we want people to know that we are wanting to share that with them and not just keep it to ourselves. Now we come to the time in our service where we are able to be a part of supporting this ministry so that for generations to come, it will be a place and a space in which people can find welcome, people can find refuge, people can find hope. Some of you have been here for a long time. Others of you have been here for a little while, and others like me and Susan just got here. But the one thing that binds us all together is that there are generations of people who kept this place alive so we could find a place of hope and we could find a place of encouragement. So I invite you all now to give as you are able so that the work and ministry of this church might indeed be something that you have invested yourself in, not simply for yourself, but for the generations yet to come who will need what this place can be. I invite the ushers to come forward.
you please join me in the prayer of dedication? God, thank you, thank you, thank you for your grace, for this community of faith, for the gifts of our lives. Bless these offerings today that they might be used to further your reign of righteousness here and now. Work through each of us and through the ministries of this congregation that we might glorify you in all we do. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 445, Be, the, Be Thou My Vision, on page 15 of the bulletin. <coughs> In the spirit of the women who survived the Middle Passage, withstood and overcame the oppression of enslavement. In the, in the spirit of women who dared obstacles and challenged unjust barriers and forged new peoples in new lands. In the, in the spirit of women who refused to be browbeaten and held back and opened new paths for others to follow. In the spirit of women who refused to be shut out and who demolished boundaries to open new spaces for sisters unborn. We go forth moving in all directions, moving at the directive of the Holy One, moving boldly and courageously in the insurance of divine guidance, anointing presence, and enabling power, in the spirit not only of our ancestors and the sisterhood, but as the direction of Sister Wisdom, Sophia, who calls each and all to encourage her for the sake of God's glory. We go forth, we go forth. Thanks be to God. Please be seated.
another of those songs. Thank you, Caesar. Thank you. That was a marvelous postlude. Thank you. Before we depart, I want to draw your attention to the last page of the bulletin, page 19. If you would like to have flowers placed in dedication of loved ones on Easter, the instructions for doing so are on page 19. So if you would like to place flowers at the altar for Easter in remembrance of loved ones now gone on to glory, um, these are the instructions. We now say our closing mantra, our worship has ended. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Amen.